The next presentation has uh, quite a puzzling title, quite entrenched, but still generic. The concept of constitutional identity in the jurisprudence of the German Federal Constitutional Court. Our lecturer is Professor Alexander Graser, a professor of public law and policy at the University of Regensburg in Germany, an expert in the field of public law, comparative law, legal sociology, and legal theory. theory. Dear Professor Graser, you have the floor. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll start by very briefly, but importantly, um, stress that I, I feel honored and I'm really grateful for, for being able to speak to you and for uh, being part of this research network, uh, which I find is a pristine opportunity to get into an exchange on really important matters. And thanks very much for your generosity also in hosting us. Thank you. I'll be as quick as I can because this is a really tough topic and we have 20 minutes, so I'll try to be on time. Um, as you said, the title might be somewhat puzzling. I hope uh, I can um, solve some of the puzzles, maybe. Um, so how does that work? I, perfect. So. Um, the outline of my talk is I'm, I'm going to very briefly sketch some background information on the constitutional um, background in Germany. We mentioned we had this workshop earlier on, um, uh, so I'll be very brief on that one, just with an eye to time. Then uh, Professor Varga uh, had mentioned the questionnaire, um, and I thought, when if not now am I going to try to respond to these questions. So I'll use the questionnaire as a kind of structure for my talk. And um, at the end, there will be some obviously just tentative uh, conclusions, tentative because, I mean, this is a uh, uh, subject which is definitely uh, open to interpretation. And um, the main idea is that we get into an exchange on, on that one. Very briefly on uh, the background, Germany um, has always been a, a dualist system with regard to international law in general, it has been moderated dualism in, in, in the recent decades. Um, but in principle, that's still the case. Uh, but Germany has also been, as you all know, a founding member of, the, of what we call the EU today. So uh, it was socialized, and I might say well socialized, under the uh, supranational regime uh, introduced by the ECJ judgments in Van Rend and Costa. In fact, there was relatively little, maybe surprisingly little, debate about the implications of direct and, uh, effect and supremacy at the time. Um, and then I'll get to that later on. Again, uh, there is still no major um, debate about that at this um, to this day. Um, the German basic law or constitution um, hardly provided any explicit basis for such supranationality in the beginning, uh, actually until it was amended uh, in 92 in light of the Maastricht Treaty, um, which, and this amendment, um, paved the way for the treaty and in a way codified essential parts of the jurisprudence we had already at the time by the German Federal Constitutional Court. Um, as many of you will probably also be aware, the German constitution does have this uh, highly entrenched um, structure. It has this eternity clause, as they call it. So some of what they perceived, uh, founding fathers, few mothers, um, perceived as kind of the core structure um, is not to be changed, at least not under the constitution. And this eternity clause actually has always been um, the source uh, of the limitations that the constitutional court sees to be in place uh, with regard to European integration. Um, now, the questions. We did have a number of questions. Some of them will, really brief, will be really brief. Some of them are quite intricate to answer with regard to Germany. You'll see. Now, how, first question, how are EU legal acts incorporated into national law? That's a very brief answer. Uh, as for secondary law, that's automatically no um, transposition necessary. For new primary law, obviously, the consent by the national legislature is um, required. And um, depending on whether or not it affects constitutional um, setup, there might be a procedural, uh, higher procedural um, demands 
also. Um, second question that we had, has there been any internal examination, legal procedure at member state level of the entry into force of the constitutional treaty and the Lisbon Treaty and its impact on the legal order of the member states? And indeed, yes, the German Federal Constitutional Court did examine the ratification of the Lisbon Treaty in a, well, book format uh, judgment. Um, and it had done that already also for the Maastricht Treaty, also book format. And we'll talk about that uh, a bit more closely in a second. So very important sources uh, for the matters that we're dealing with here. Um, now, a question that uh, requires uh, somewhat more thorough answers. Number three, on which issues has the National Constitutional Court refused to intervene in order to protect national law and competence and on what grounds? Now, as a background, um, starting from the early 70s onwards, um, the German Federal Constitutional Court and mind, as I mentioned, without much of a textual basis in the Constitution at the time, um, the German Federal Constitutional Court um, has constantly assumed the authority to check legal actions of the EU or its predecessors um, for resulting violations of the German basic law. So the court did assume such authority very early on. Um, over the years, the court has framed, developed, and reframed at times the yardstick for this control. And it has come more or less close to hold a legal measure of the EU to be irreconcilable with the requirements of the basic law. But it has actually done that only once, right? That's what we already heard Professor Waga refer to the PSPT, uh, PSPP judgment of um, 2020. Um, and since the court has returned to its previous approach, only last week um, they handed down a judgment which reads very different from what we saw in PSPP and which very much reminds um, the reader of uh, the time before. Now, um, this question, as I said, requires a bit uh, more of a thorough answer. And one of the issues um, that puzzled me when, when preparing and actually throughout our work is, the um, question is, when did the court intervene? And uh, I mean, strictly speaking, they just, as I said, once struck down um, or held in reconcilable a measure and a legal act of the EU. But I mean, oftentimes we refer to courts as watchdogs, and I'll use that metaphor probably excessively today. Um, does a watchdog intervene only if it bites? Or is it that uh, maybe even the intended, expected intervention of a watchdog is that it barks? Right. And if we think barking is relevant to this question, then um, I have much more of a story to tell than if we were to focus just on the bite, right? Because actually, um, the German Constitutional Court has been barking, if you will, for decades and loudly. Um, and we'll have a brief look at that one. I mean, this is a dilemma. I mean, by redefining intervention as so as to include barking, I open up the door for more material to be covered. But at the same time, the material is far too broad, <laughs> far too broad to, to present it here. I hope I'll be able to squeeze it into the written um, contribution. But there's, uh, I might tell you, a lot of cases, depending on how you count, 15 plus or minus, uh, that you could certainly want to take into account, probably even more of the German Constitutional Court that contained such barking. The issues um, that have come up, so I have to summarize, can can do the um, individual uh, decisions at this point. The issues, the areas of conflict uh, that led the German Constitutional Court to um, comment on uh, the requirements for EU law to be in conformity with uh, the German basic law, um, where at first mainly fundamental rights issues, so individual, potentially individual 
um, violations um, of uh, fundamental rights. Um, later on, uh, with Maastricht, actually the Maastricht Treaty, the issue of democratic legitimacy uh, was moved to the um, forum um, and at the center stage for a while. Same time, the issue, uh, well, safeguarding the principle of conferral and of limited conferral, uh, the awkward German expression that made it into international um, speak. Uh, is the competence competence uh, notion that was uh, that emerged uh, in the Maastricht judgment, and later on um, in most recent years, um, in the most more recent years, uh, more and more the issues were about budgetary sovereignty, so EU spending and liabilities on the national level for that. The criteria that the court developed in these decisions and mind. They, until two years ago, never struck down any of the challenged measures. Um, but the criteria that they developed were really strict in, and were perceived to be more or less strict depending on the time. And after having issued a relatively strong statement, they oftentimes kind of soften it up later on, etc. But the criteria that have emerged are the ones that I try to listen um, to list here. One is um, in the beginning we were talking about uh, human rights, potential human rights violations. So will measures by um, EU agents um, be in conformity with human rights standards as uh, framed by the basic law? This is no longer a separate category because it has been swallowed by um, ensuing jurisprudence. Second one, and uh, practically the most important one, is the control of ultra-virus acts. Um, so this is basically about, as I mentioned, the principle of uh, limited conferral and uh, the question of whether uh, the insistence on that the EU um, doesn't have a competence competence, so cannot widen its, all, its own scope of, of action. Um, and most broadly, uh, arguably, the all-encompassing category is the check um, of a violation of constitutional identity. I'll get to a uh, question of what that might mean in a second. What is really important about these criteria, however, is that they um, come with a number of way, general features. One is they are potentially applicable to all measures by EU actors, so any kind of action uh, that can be derived um, or can be traced back to EU actors. And that has just recently, in the last week's decision, be, been reconfirmed and strengthened. Um, second, um, only qualified violations are relevant. This is a very strong filter. So the court says, well, we check for all these criteria, but minor violations won't count. We won't really interfere unless it's grave. And uh, different ways to, to, to formulate that test, uh, the most common, I think, is it needs to be of evident and of structural importance. Um, and lastly, a very important procedural safeguard. Get to that at the last question of our questionnaire again. Um, when we talk about constitutional dialogue, um, the court has um, put itself um, under the regime of a practice of asking the ECJ first. So before uh, they might eventually bite, uh, they would give the European Court of Justice a chance to put, th put things straight first. Okay, now with that in mind, uh, fourth question, on which issues has the National Constitutional Court acted in defense of national law and competence and how and what was the scope of the case from the point of view of the exercise of competence by the EU and of the member states? Um, well, barking aside, we focus on the bite and two near bite cases. Now, um, as mentioned very briefly, what was uh, PSPP about? So the one occasion when the German Constitutional Court actually decided to bite. Um, that was in 2020. It was um, about public uh, sector purchase program um, that was administered uh, by the European Central Bank and the European Central Banking System. Um, the court did in the, in indeed in this case follow its own 
regime to ask the European Court of Justice to review this. First, by a request for a preliminary ruling. Um, the European Court of Justice, however, let it pass. Um, and then the German Federal Constitutional Court came and labeled uh, this decision, and specifically the part in which the European Court of Justice checked for the um, cons uh, proportionality of the decision of the European uh, Central Bank. And the German court labeled this application of the proportionality test as simply not understandable and thus objectively arbitrary um, because of its perceived failure to engage in a proper pro proportionality test. And you know, us Germans, we are really confident that if it comes to proportionality, we know, right? <laughs> so um, in a way, you see the price for heightening the standard. If you argue uh, that only grave, evident um, violations count, then of course you're in trouble if you ever express that, that such a um, violation has been in place and obviously quite a tough uh, message to send to the European Court of Justice. Um, and the ultimate holding was a decision of ultra virus. Um, now there's a major debate in Germany, you, you refer to that, whether it was a wise thing to bite at all and whether it, uh, it was the right decision to do that. Um, and I'll mention just two other candidates very briefly uh, for potential biting um, that we've seen. One is a case on the European arrest warrant um, in which the, Duke, um, the German Constitutional Court uh, in 2015 uh, came as close as it, as it gets to uh, finding um, a violation of constitutional identity. The issue was uh, the extradition requested by Italy on a um, European arrest warrant um, of a person who had been sentenced to a criminal sanction in Italy without being present and without being represented in the procedure. So, uh, the claim was um, you cannot, and the thing was the, uh, the procedure in Italy wouldn't allow for another challenge, a reopening of the case. So the claim was, well, this is contrary to uh, um, our conception of the rule of law, and that's part of um, the um, constitutional identity, so we cannot possi possibly act on this arrest warrant. Um, but the Constitution Court expressed all of that, and actually say, would be against our constitutional identity to do so, but then say, well, you know, but the European Court of Justice certainly would have found uh, the same result anyways under the uh, Charter of Fundamental Rights. So, and we don't even have to ask them because it's so clear. Um, and so they at least seemingly remained in line uh, with the requests of the European Union. Um, so they didn't bite after all, but came really close to that. Now, the most recent judgment last week's judgment that I mentioned was um, about this post-COVID huge um, spending, uh, huge fund allowing for um, spending on part of the EU and the respective contributions of the member states, the program Next Generation EU, um, has been extremely uh, uh, controversial, uh, not only in Germany, I think, um, and certainly people would argue that if the court decided to bite at some point, this might have been a much more important um, moment to do so. But in light of the history and also in light of the really controversial echo that they got on the PSPP judgment, this one, as I said, uh, reads as soft uh, as it gets and, and as what we knew for, for a long time. Um, I had known for a long time the court to be the court's approach. Now, Two more questions that we can be really brief with. Um, one is, has the interpretation of Article 2 TU, particularly with regard to the rule of law, been reflected in the practice of the National Constitutional Court or Supreme Courts, and if so, on what grounds? Um, second, the interpretation of Article 4, and here the specific regard is to national identity. A uh, brief answer would be no, not in Germany. And the explanation of that is, in a way, historical. As I told you, the whole jurisprudence of the German Constitutional Court predates these provisions. Um, and the starting point, 
maybe a bit egocentric or overly patriotic of the German Federal Constitutional Court is not European law in this, but it's the eternity clause and the core elements of the German Constitution. So um, the court starts from German law and at times notes in passing um, that these requirements are respected explicitly in EU law as well. Now, completely different question and methodologically quite difficult to answer. How has the academic position changed from accession to the present day as regards the assessment of the impact of EU law on the member states, primacy, relevance of uh, court decisions, etc.? Technically, and speaking about Germany, you would have to cover 50, 60 years um, of academic debate. Um, and being part of, of that community, it's of course difficult to really distance oneself sufficiently to, to know. I'll try to make some, well, subjective, inescapably subjective uh, comments on that. First, the decisions in Van Gent and Costa, as I mentioned, uh, didn't really trigger a lot of debate at the time. Um, same is true um, for the German Federal Constitutional Court's insistence that there are limits on European integration. There's wide agreement, certainly in procedural terms. Integration has to follow the rules, and otherwise it doesn't, or further steps of integration have to follow the procedural rules as foreseen uh, in the primary law. Second, also, in substantive terms, there are limits. And interestingly, a uh, feature of the German debate seems to be it always depends on what the structure and the actual state of the European Union is. Substantive limits might be stronger now than at the later stage of European integration. I think we can conclude from that that the remaining battleground for academic debate is relatively narrow. It's because all of the premises mentioned before are more or less accepted by everybody. Um, so the f debate predominantly revolves around the question of how should the German uh, federal constitutional, sorry, it's not V but C in the end, court interpret its role as a watchdog. Now, I've tried very tentatively to list some positions um, and uh, assign some quantitative weight to them. So those who would like the court to have bitten more often, I think are in a relatively small minority. There are very few of these. That's certainly not uh, a strong opinion uh, in Germany. Those who think uh, the court should have bitten on other occasions, I think are more. I think PSPP by many is considered to be the wrong moment to actually um, concretize to realize uh, the court's insistence. Um, th those who think the court should have barked less loudly or in a softer voice think there, there are many of them. And the main point in this is you can't bark without biting and see what happens if you bite, right? Um, so I guess that's a relative majority. It's not an absolute term, certainly. Um, and some uh, might even claim that they should just uh, quit being a watchdog at all and stop biting. Again, certainly a minority. And I think the latter two positions are incrementally gaining force over time in the relative um, balance of this debate. Um, in mind, this is a specific perspective, of course, from Germany, of course, of a member state that has been a member for a long time, that has shaped the EU a lot. And most importantly, I think, as the largest economy within the European uh, Union, there's a lot of self-interest in that. Adherence to uh, EU law, if it comes in exchange for adherence by the others, might well pay off, right? So this could be maybe overly realistic, pragmatic explanation of the um, debate. Um, now, last question uh, in connection with the above questions, is the method of constitutional dialogue in force in the member states um, among which institutions has this practice developed? 
I'm, I wasn't really sure whether I could thoroughly answer the dialogue question. So I thought communication might be a better uh, term, at least for, for my perspective here. Um, and this is because there are many interlocutors of the court and because I, I felt competent mainly, mainly to, to, for looking at what the court did. So what the court, court certainly did over time is it ensured to be part of this dialogue, to be connected. And it has done so by um, inventing very creatively an actionable right, subjective entitlement to democracy. You'd be surprised if you were to look into the German constitution. That was an invention of the Maastricht Treaty and it has been reaffirmed and reaffirmed and reaffirmed, which basically means all integration steps quite alien to the German constitution procedural setup can be challenged in, by individual com constitutional complaints. So you can read that as making sure that the court is in the business in all cases, right? In all major steps of, of um, European integration. The court does send out signals um, and it does so selectively because, and that's probably the, the point behind this filter that I mentioned earlier, um, it must be structurally relevant, evident violations that they deal with because they can then get propositions in a way, complaints, but they don't have to act upon it unless they want to. So selectivity um, in sending out signals is also uh, founded in its procedural approach and it's being challenged all the time. It's always, you always read passages on, well, is this really a structural or evident violation or not? But probably the criterion doesn't, shouldn't be taken that seriously. It's about selectivity and sending out signals, I claim. Um, it does send out these signals specifically. So if we pick one pair of, of interlocutors for dialogue, it's between the European Court of Justice and the German Federal Constitutional Court. And they do send out these signals specifically to the European Court by putting it themselves under the uh, regime of at least considering a preliminary a referral for preliminary ruling first. Um, but I think they have found out that the European Court of Justice doesn't really play along the rules and, and doesn't respond that much to them. Well, and they hope for responses. So I'll come to an end very briefly, uh, tentative conclusions. Um, there's this saying, a barking dog never bites. Uh, well, they did, and maybe the rule applies only if you respect its message. And I'm sure the German Constitutional Court at the time in 2020 thought the European Court of Justice didn't respect its message. It didn't stay clear of, of, of uh, the, the dog. Um, very interesting question is, can you return just to barking again? Can they readopt the old uh, approach? Um, and that depends a lot on uh, whether you perceive the bite to have been effective or not. Difficult question and yet to be seen. Um, and what is it actually that our national watchdog in chief has been defending vigorously, at least at times? I think here's an important thing to be noted in our, in our last point I'm making um, in our exchange, and that is um, the concept of constitutional identity as defended by the German National Constitutional Court is really minimal, right? And it doesn't seem to be really correct, uh, about characteristics of the German system. I mean, interesting to hear um, what you think about that. But my sense is that this is what they perceive of as minimal criteria of some core standards of democracy, rule of law, etc. And hence, there's a very common understanding and interpretation of what the court does or of how the court interp interprets its own role. And that is as a supervisor of the European Court of Justice and the other European institutions. So maybe quite a presumptuous position for the German court to tell the European central organizations, um, specifically the court, how to do their, how to perform their task best. So maybe the watchdog is not really watching anything that is particularly German or national part of our national identity, but rather uh, a supervisor of democracy and rule of law in Europe in their own eyes. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.